Do you want to start off? Yeah, welcome to GeekFest Volume 2.2, 2, I would say, call it. Version yes. 2.0, yeah. day 2. Day, day 2, <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, uh, we have here uh, Roy Nordblum uh, on the other side of the channel. Yep. And we have here... From 8,000 miles away. 8,000 miles away. And, and John traveled 8,000 miles to come here to have a chat. I guess my doctor's <laughs> advice, by the way. It's uh, 9.30 in the morning, his time. And uh, Roy, where are you at? Describe your, your physical location there. Okay, I'm in Palo Alto. Uh, it's a place called College Terrace. It's uh, very near to Stanford. Okay. I was just uh, catching a chicken. A chicken got loose in the yard, so I was just out there trying to put it back away. We have to uh, uh, get the volume a little bit uh, uh, correct here. Yeah, equalize the volume. Can you can yeah, you say? Sound like, it okay. sounds like a little bit of feedback going on there. Maybe some echo. Actually, then now it's good. Now it's good. Okay. I can control the volume a little bit from here too. So. So, what were you doing? And where were you going to school when you were near Edwards Air Force Base? Were your folks uh, in the Air Force at the time, or were you just going to high school near there? Uh, what's the situation there? Okay, my, my grandparents bought some land in the high desert near the Air Force Base, Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, they built a, a, a compound, a family compound of houses right on the edge of the Air Force Base. And then years later, they started the astronaut training program there. And the astronauts needed a place to live near the base. And so my family leased out the houses in the neighborhood to the astronauts. So basically, I grew up uh, with astronauts as my neighbors. Cool. Uh, there, it was one of the cool things about it is that there was the, uh, the rocket, tests, rocket test site. It was about five miles from my parents' house. And uh, uh, when I was a kid, I saw them firing up. What they do is they take these rockets and turn them upside down with the exhaust pointed up so that the force goes down into the earth. And uh, it, they'd fire these things in the evening, and there'd be a tongue of flame, just a huge flame up in the sky. I saw the, the Atlas V5 motors being fired. It was just the most amazing thing, just the sheer raw power of a, a pillar of flame jumping in the sky. And I saw it from my bed window when I was a kid. And so you you were involved in, in technic, technical uh, uh, stories and, and computers since you was you were born, uh, it's interesting that uh, because I lived bicycle distance from the uh, NASA, I used to sneak on base all the time. I'd take my bicycle and I'd ride on the base. Well, it was just a kid, you know, nine, ten, eleven years old. But they thought it was cute that I liked the science. <coughs> so, so the scientists at, at NASA, at Edwards, they would show off their equipment and. Uh, uh, Back in those days, it was called a dog and pony show. When you have the uh, you, the people who give you money to do your job, every once in a while you have to do a dog and pony show for them so they can see what you're doing and what neat new technology you've got going on. And so these scientists, they would do dog and pony shows for me. I was a little kid. And so I grew up with uh, analog instruments. And, uh, and it's funny, we didn't really have computers then. Uh, they used slide rule. You would move the little slide rule and... Look up the number. It's really remarkable to me that we sent people to the moon using slide rules. Amazing. Uh, so my first computer, I, I built my first computer. It was a kit. And it had, uh, it had a circuit board and a little red glowing lights. I think there were, uh, there were a series of four uh, LED. I don't think there were any LEDs then. But it was registers. And we could, I could actually program my microprocessor to step through one step at a time. It really didn't do much, but I had a lot of fun programming it. And um, Was it an Altair? Uh, uh, I, I was it an Altair, Altair, Altair. 880 kit, computer in a kit? from a Exactly, yeah. Okay. And then uh, at the local college, they came up with a uh, 
their very first computer programming class. And I, I was in the very first computer programming class at the local college. And we learned uh, Fortran and COBOL. And uh, Fortran and COBOL is about what they had those days. And uh, it, we ran on an IBM System 3 where we would uh, we uh, put each instruction on a card. And then the cards would go in a stack. And we'd have a stack of cards that we would take and physically put into the machine. And it would run the instructions one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. If you didn't have your cards uh, in the right order, then your your program wouldn't work. You're talking about and the Hollerith cards, right? They were the, we had the mini Hollerith cards is the way we used to program. And looking back at it now, the, the trivial things that we did then are, are a joke compared to what we can do now. But it's interesting that that's the way I grew up, with punch cards. And then, then you uh, got uh, over to Stanford? Well, first, when I was still at Edwards, they, there's something they call the, the DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. And uh, they came up with a, a network of these installations. Uh, one of the first ones was at Edwards Air Force Base at NASA. And what it amounted to, basically, was a teletypewriter, uh, which would show one line of, of, at a time. It would, it would advance. One line, one line, one line, one line, one line. It was very primitive. And uh, there was not much we could do with the ARPANET then. Uh, the uh, file, FTP, File Transfer Protocol, hadn't been de developed yet. Um, and it was a toy, a very expensive toy. And I was a 17-year-old kid playing with it. Uh, nobody knew really what to do with this ARPANET thing. And so I was the guy who dreamed up that we could use it for DXing. Captain Crunch, you know, you're a radio guy, so you know what DXing is. It's you, you send out a call to the world and see who responds to you. And uh, uh, I wrote the, a simple protocol for people to answer in a one-line code uh, where they're DXing from, who they DX, DX to, and the signal strength and so on. And it got adopted. It, it, just because I filled the void, my little system got adopted on the very earliest ARPANET. And I was just a kid. I was like 17 years old. Um, I was also doing the same thing. I had a ASR33 teletype at home, and this was in 1972, 1973, and I was also accessing the NASA computers or NASA Ames Research Center, and uh, I was getting into, I think, I, I remember I was typing in L space 15, for instance, to get into MIT, and then L space 9, for instance, to get into another university, so they had probably like 20 or 30 university computers all tied together in the ARPANET. Yeah, it was a, it was a toy then. There really wasn't very anything useful being done on it. How many uh, nodes were on the ARPANET when you first entered it? Uh, in the 20s, 22, 23, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's about right. Do you know uh, Tovar from the AI lab at Stanford? Yeah, Tovar. What about Ken Schumacher? Ken Schumacher also, he was one of the programmers there. I go oh. up to the AI lab almost every every night and hang out with those guys. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's one thing I wanted to mention, is that uh, I was watching the Geek Fest yesterday, and uh, uh, almost every single person who was on yesterday mentioned Lee Felsenstein. Yes. He's and in, in fact, uh, when I was uh, 17 years old, and I was a budding computer geek, I wanted to be part of this thing called the Homebrew Computer Club. I'd read about it in uh, Byte Magazine or uh, so, some early early thing, and I wanted to be part of the Homebrew Computer Club. And so I wrote to Lee Felsenstein saying that I wanted to join. But it turns out that you actually had to be at the meeting to talk to the other people, and that's what it was all about. But he sent me a very nice long letter explaining how the Homebrew Computer Club works. And then when I ended up going to Stanford in 77, I started up with the homebrew uh, from the first time I got there. Uh, the homebrew was a wonderful place to meet people and learn new things and, uh, and get gigs. Uh, I was a student at Stanford, and I needed to have a student job. And uh, within weeks, within weeks of arriving at the university, I had my first job uh, working with computers. And it was thanks to the homebrew computer club connection. Yeah, Lee, uh, 
Lee also was on, at the Geek Fest last year here. Uh -huh. Yeah, for the people on the stream who are interested, we have on our page the recordings from last year, and you can listen to one hour of Lee Felsenstein's ancient memories of computing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Lee didn't like me. Uh, there was a group of us young people who, uh, we, we, frankly, we, a lot of us thought that the, the homebrew computer club was kind of boring because it was all about hardware, 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 hardware. And uh, we were interested in hardware and software. We wanted to make a holistic thing. Well, you had and to have hardware before software. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so a lot of times we got... Tape. Software uh, came on paper tape, tape, right? Yeah, paper tape. I can remember that uh, somebody brought uh, a paper tape, punch tape of uh, Microsoft Basic, and uh, we got a letter an open letter from Bill Gates chastising us six ways from Sunday about how, how bad it was to copy software. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and he asked the people to, to, to send him letters with dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah, to pay for I it. I think it was, it was Dan Sokol. It was. Who uh, yeah. was the, uh, the first software pirate. He was, yes. So, so we did the same thing at Stanford. That, uh, so what people may not know is that the PDP-10s or the PDP early computers, you had to have a tape that had little dots on the tape. And the dots, would the tape would run through a reader, and that's how you would start your machine. So for a modern person, you might think of it as a uh, BIOS. Uh, it sets up the memories and all of the original conditions for the computation to, to proceed. And uh, the university... They felt, they felt that uh, they paid us money, researchers, that they should get the paper tapes, and they didn't want us to share them. But uh, we, there, even then, in the, in the late 70s, there was a hacker culture, and we really believed that we wanted to uh, share what we learned with everybody else. So we shared our paper tapes, even though the university, they didn't like us sharing. But we did it anyway, because we really felt it was important to get the new information out. How were paper tapes uh, in the first moment produced when you have programmed some program? And how did it got to the tape at first? What, uh, how was this machine? What, what for machines were you using for that? Uh, it was a physical machine. Uh, it, was a, it was a typewriter. And uh, uh, I don't really remember how they made the tapes. I just remember that uh, they were very valuable to us. Uh, you couldn't start the computer without the tape. And you can only start the computer in certain ways with certain tapes. I can remember you had to also use the switches to switch in about uh, 10 or 15 bytes of a loader. The loader routine would then load the tape uh, from, uh, from a paper tape reader that you get at Haltech Electronics. Mm. And hey, I wanted, okay. Can I share another story? Sure. Uh, when I went to Stanford, uh, as a freshman, I needed a, a student job. And uh, there was something just st just then starting that year. It was called the Stanford Recycling Project. And uh, I said, recycling? What's recycling? Because uh, the recycling was something that was done in the, in the industrial world. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a common household uh, thing, recycling. Um, but there at Stanford, we, we started the recycling project where we would sort our trash and the bottles and cans and, uh, and get a money going for it from our, the waste stream. We were the first major university to do it. And then Palo Alto was the first city to copy. And, um, so it's kind of cool that we were really, we invented household recycling in the modern way in 1977 at Stanford. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah. The Germans love that. They, no, always, they always do it. Tell us a little bit about the uh, about the Green Valley expert, or your, your uh, how your what you do in uh, in recycling and uh, green living, and some of the things that uh, that we were uh, engaged in when I was uh, visiting you on a number of occasions, where you were uh, building solar panels and and uh, sustainable living situations. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So. Um well, first, just the background is I was a computer guy, and my degree from Stanford is in computers, and um, my, my whole life was being a hacker. But when I got older, I decided that sustainability was something that I wanted to pursue. And so I became one of the first uh, sustainability people uh, 
you know, I became one of the first green general contractors. And uh, back then, uh, sustainability, what's that? Uh, it's something that we sort of brought into the world. Uh, people didn't really care, but we cared. And uh, so, uh, French man, here, how about this? You may not remember this, but I met you back in the 70s at a homebrew computer club. But you don't remember me. I remembered you because you were my hero. And then in, in, again in the 80s, I was at MIT. I ran into you again. You don't remember me, but I remember you because you were one of my heroes. <laughs> and it wasn't until, uh, I think, 2011 in California, I was at the Hacker Dojo teaching a class on money hacking that right. I met you again. And, and then we had a conversation. So it took a while for us to finally meet like that. Tell us a little bit about the Hacker Dojo in Mountain View. That's a, one of the first hacker spaces in the Bay Area, right? Yeah, the hacker space was a, a new concept. It's called co-working, where you uh, take your resources and combine them, and you have a, a space that you use for hacking and for uh, programming. Here in uh, Silicon Valley, there's a lot of people very interested in... Uh, in startups and entrepreneurship, and uh, it was it was uh, kind of a logical place for the Hacker Dojo to pop into existence. And in fact, uh, it's been so successful, it's been copied uh, many, many times. And so the Hacker Dojo is really the first uh, hackerspace, and it's still going now. Uh, it's uh, okay. quite a uh, when was quite it, a population of smart people. When was it open the first time? When did they found it? I can't answer that. Uh, I'm kind of a latecomer to the Hacker Dojo. One of the problems is that they, they charge money. They charge a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, I always try to find a way to, to do the same thing without money. And so I was sort of a, a latecomer to the Hacker Dojo just because they were so focused on money, and I was not. Yeah, just the uh, same thinking as, uh, as Richard Stallman. You know, here in Berlin, they've got the Seabase uh, hacker space, which has a very interesting uh, uh, concept to it. Uh, Oliver, why don't you elaborate a little bit on that, just so people know. Oh, that's a nice community here in Berlin. And, uh, yeah, they, 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 they assume this is a spaceship. And it's also a co-working space. And uh, so people come there, I think, every day, I would say. So we can Almost every day everything. since I've been in Berlin, we go there yeah. at night time to hang out and drink it's and everything. Very, very decored space, I would say. So it's really looking like a spaceship. When you go in there, you, you pop up into another world. No kidding. No and also, kidding. when I was there too, the they had this uh, mesh radio network system project here in Berlin where they were setting up free Wi-Fi hotspots for the refugees. To get online, yeah, and that that's started good. here in Berlin. Yeah, we have here a free net, free net system, and yeah, we're trying to get the gr the grid off the grid. Can you say that? The grid off the grid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, but but back to your to your younger days, you taught yourself Lisp, uh, a, a very uh, interesting programming language, right? Yeah, it's it's funny that uh, it's almost uh, iconic. Uh, the early, most of the early hackers that I knew were all artificial intelligence programmers because that was uh, the, the most interesting thing happening and uh, we were sort of attracted to it. Though there was a whole generation before us of the phone freakers and uh, there was already a, somewhat of a hacker ethic that had been started by the late 70s. Uh, yesterday, I don't think anybody talked about the hacker ethic. So if I could take a minute to, to explain that. Please do. Yes. Okay, well, there's uh, a certain culture at, at the university, at Stanford, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, but the people who were academics, they had a certain culture, and they were not very playful. They were very focused on their academics. And then there was the uh, commercial uh, people, like uh, B.B. and Bolt Brat, Eric Newman, and... Uh, Bolt Brat, Newman. They were, very, they were very interested in money, and uh, they weren't interested in play or fun. They were money people, and and then there was a group of us that we call ourselves hackers, where uh, the, the idea, the first hackers were people who make furniture with an axe. We use really primitive tools to make something really cool. And one characteristic that most hackers had is we like to play with our toys. It was very playful. Uh, playing with your toys means taking your toys and taking them apart. And then putting them back together in new ways. And, uh, and we only wanted to have toys that we could play with really play with. So 
so there's stuff, uh, the, the new companies are coming out with proprietary software where they didn't give you the source code. And without the source code, how do you play with it? You don't only use it the way that it was intended to use. And that's no fun at all. And uh, so the hacker culture was uh, very much, uh, we would share with each other. Uh, we, whenever we would learn something new or fun, exciting to do, we would tell everybody about it. Uh, we didn't try to monetize it. We didn't try to get something out of it. Uh, we, we had a lot of play, a lot of fun. And uh, when I was a first hacker, there was probably 200 of us in the whole world. In the entire world, there were probably 200 of us people who would like to play with our hacking toys. And now there are hundreds of thousands of self-identified hackers. And so uh, it's really funny to see that uh, some of the things that we did, like wordplay and, uh, and sharing our toys, is now uh, popular among this huge population of, of young people. And it's something that we started many, many years ago. And so I'm kind of proud of that. And playing, uh, I on, the, that uh, and playing on the defense network of the ARPANET, because the ARPANET, from what I understand, uh, the company Bolt, Brannock & Newman, which was the company that had a government contract to tie together all the universities together in the event of war. So that what they wanted to do was to have a large distributed computing system on a separate alternate channel in the phone system. So they set up these things called IMPs or uh, processor uh, units that would connect each of the computer systems together through, I think it was a 64 KB line originally. And uh, that's where they set up the 20 or so colleges and universities it all became part of the ARPANET at that point. Eventually, later on, it became the Internet, as many, many more uh, imps and processors were tied into the network. And at that point, remember back in the old time, they used to have the bang addresses, like well, bang, crunch, IHNP4, yeah. bang, uh, GNU, bang, well, bang, crunch, and they had bang addresses where you can kind of route your mail through that. Then later on, of course, they... They converted it over into the at sign addresses that they had today. And so I was crunch at well dot com back in the day when I was on the well. Because that was the first uh, computer system I got online that was on the Internet. Originally, the well wasn't even on the Internet at that point. Well stands for Whole Earth Electronic Link. And it was uh, put together by uh, Barry Brilliant and uh, a number of other people from the, uh, from the uh, I think it was the, uh, um, the person, uh, Bob Albrecht, had something to do with the well as well. It became the a very interesting online community at the oh, well. Oh, yeah, the well community, yeah. And they called it well beings. <laughs> the well beings, yeah. <laughs> Have you been on the well ever on that system? No, no, that was before my time. Okay. But I, I heard about it and I knew about it, yes. Yeah. Okay, can I talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence? You are allowed to. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, so, so there I was, a freshman at Stanford in 1977, and I was already a computer hacker. I'd been doing it for years. I'd been uh, hacking the ARPANET. And, uh, and so when I went to the uh, computer science department, I was looking for a job. And um, uh, they hired me as soon as I walked in. I, I knew uh, programming languages. I knew assembler. And uh, I, I'd been a hacker for a while. So I was a freshman, 17 years old, and I was starting, my first project was on something called the Dendral program. And the Dendral program was what they call an expert system. And so for some of you out there, this is going to be a little boring, but an expert system is a system where they, they take human knowledge and turn it into a series of rules. Uh, for instance, uh, if, then, else. That if this is true, then this. Else, something else is true. And just by taking this very common heuristic of if-then-else, you can build these really complicated decision trees that, uh, that do useful things. And uh, the one that, that uh, I worked on was called Dendral. And the Dendral program, uh, was the, just the people working on it, uh, Ed Feigenbaum was my boss at the Stanford Computer Science Department. And Ed Feigenbaum is considered the, the father of modern AI. And, uh, and I worked with him for years on this, this cool program. Uh, Carl Jurassi. I don't know if you heard Carl Jurassi, but he invented the, uh, the pill, the, uh, you know, the reproductive pill. And uh, Carl Jurassi was just an amazing person, but he was one of my bosses on this project. And just, just being able to talk to this guy and work with him was a, such an honor. And the third person on the project was uh, Joshua Letterberg. And Joshua Letterberg was an amazing person also. Uh, he, he, in fact, became the, um, 
the director of the NIH, National Institute of Health, which is one of the major uh, funder for this new thing called the ARPANET. And uh, the cool thing about this is that uh, years later, uh, Joshua Letterberg, uh, when the Internet first started, when it went from the ARPANET to the Internet, uh, Joshua Letterberg insisted that people that had worked for him in his laboratories get listed first when this new thing called the Internet comes out. And the way he did that was by supplying the first who is list. The who is was a way of identifying who is on the, the network. And so uh, when the, the very first who is came out, I was number 68. And so that's a, a point of pride for me. I was one of the first 100 people on the Internet. Yeah. But I really wanted to be number 69. I didn't quite make that. <laughs> what uh, was your who is entry back at that time? What did it look like? It was n.nordblom at Sumex AIM. Uh, Sumex AIM stood for Stanford University Medical Experimental Computer for Artificial Intelligence and Medicine, Sumex AIM. And uh, we were doing uh, computer work in support of modern medicine. Uh, can I go on? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my next, because I, I for the Dendral project, uh, all I did was I put comments into it. That uh, there was this big program that had been written with not one comment. So it was very dense. And so my job was to just go through, read it, understand it, and put comments in. And apparently I did well because my next job was for something called the Molgen Project. Molgen stops for molecular genetics. And uh, it was really quite uh, amazing what they were doing is they were uh, taking DNA and cutting it, cutting it different places using chemicals and trying to sequence the DNA to make the, the DNA find all the different parts. And uh, it's a computationally very difficult task, uh, sequencing DNA. And so we were using artificial intelligence methods. Uh, we were using heuristics. And in fact, uh, it was so successful that, uh, that it became a, a very popular tool in the early DNA sequencing world. And uh, my, my contribution is that, uh, well, first I want to mention that these days, it was very primitive back then. We didn't have home computers. We didn't have personal computers. It was all on mainframe computers. And during the, uh, the work day, the mainframe computers got really jammed up because the people were doing routine uh, administrative tasks and so on. At night, at night is when we could run the really big computationally intensive uh, artificial intelligence programs. And so, uh, so a lot of us hackers, we were real night owls. We would sleep during the day and then work at night on the computer. And in those days, it's because that's when you could get cycles. Um, that's when, yeah, that's when the, the computers aren't so busy. Exactly. And uh, so uh, the point is that uh, what, we had this uh, regular development cycle that uh, during the day, the geneticists would take the information from the previous day and uh, elucidate rules that using certain uh, amino acids are cut by certain regions. And uh, by looking at the previous day's activity, they sent me suggestions on what to do for the next day. And so during the night, I would take the suggestions from the geneticists, and I would implement it in code. Um, half the time, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, it was experimental. You know, we were, it, was, it was research. But it was very, very effective. Uh, in the space of uh, three months, I improved the system uh, throughput by two orders of magnitude. So 10, 100, 100 times faster and more effective. And uh, the tool uh, turned out to be very, uh, the word is seminal, very useful basic tool in the recombinant DNA gene sequencing world, which led to what we now call biotech. And so just because of this student job I had at Stanford in 1978, I'm one of the grandfathers of biotech. <laughs> If I, I want to mention uh, to the streaming uh, users and to our uh, um, attendants here, uh, we have a ask a speaker function on our web page. So if anyone wants to ask a question to Roy, uh, you can do that by going to our schedule page and you find on the right side area uh, ask a speaker uh, links and just select uh, now it's panel four on day two and uh yeah ask your questions we will take it in the uh q and a at the end of the and talk. you can also uh use the hashtag uh geekfest berlin on twitter and get your tweets in now 
if you have any questions, because we're going to read those tweets back when it comes time for questions. Sounds okay. good. Only a little side note. So you're you're back. back. Carry on. <laughs> Carry on. Okay. Yeah, get me started. I'll tell you stories all day. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, w I would like to. Could you go a little bit into how was uh, how was it to work with Dendro? Um, this, uh, how, which computer would run it? Was it, uh, were there terminals you were connecting? Um, how was it to work in that day with these old systems? Oh, it, it's nothing like it is today. It was, it was very difficult, uh, to do, uh, debugging and programming. Uh, we were, it was a time sharing machine. We didn't have dedicated pro uh, computers. So, so we had to share the, Uh, resources with everybody else. It was actually the machines that we were using in those days were the PDP-10s. And uh, PDP-10s were the really hot machines now. When we look back at it, it you know, your your uh, smartphone probably has more computing power than we had then. Speaking of PDP-10s, I met this guy in Washington, D.C. He lives up on the 12th floor of a large apartment complex, and he has a PDP-10 in his living room. <laughs> Fully functional, by the way. PD uh, Pintana's got this a knob that controls the CPU speed, so you can dial it way down, and you can trace uh, trace it step, 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 and you can crank it way up, so you have a control over the speed of the CPU with a dial. That's right. We were told never to touch that that dial, though. <laughs> And uh, you you also met um, Richard Stallman at the MIT uh, AI Lab. Yeah, so uh, I I had different times in my life as a hacker. Uh, I was at Stanford originally, and then I went to MIT in the 80s. Uh, I was at MIT AI Lab uh, 1982 to 1983, where I did applications programming uh, for artificial intelligence. And uh, they came out with a new thing called the Lisp machine. And the Lisp machine was the very first time that we had a, a dedicated computer. One person has one computer, and uh, the Lisp machine was very, very powerful, and it had this uh, bit graphic screen that was just beautiful. Uh, we were very proud to have our Lisp machines then. And, but the most interesting thing about being at MIT AI Lab in 82 and 83, aside from doing the artificial intelligence and the vision research that I worked on, was RMS. Uh, the world knows him as Richard Stallman. But back then, in the uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, he was RMS, uh, which stands for Richard M. Stallman. And, and he he preferred to be called RMS. And uh, so to me, I still think of him as RMS, cause, uh, but the rest of the world knows him as Richard. And uh, he was very, he was, he was the brightest of us. He was like our, our mascot at the MIT AI Lab. And he came up with this idea for, uh, for free software, not free like free beer, But free is in its, uh, it's free from being controlled by corporations and proprietary interests. It would be uh, software that you could uh, compile yourself, you can uh, change it, you can share it with your friends. It was free software, and uh, so I became one of the original free software movement people. I can prove it. Uh, uh, when we had the big, uh, Richard had a big press conference at the AI Lab, and afterwards we had a, uh, we took a, a group picture. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a famous picture of Jesus or painting of Jesus Christ at the Last Supper, with yeah. the 12 disciples and Jesus in the middle. We did that for our photograph, but we had 13 AI lab members with RMS in the middle. And, and RMS is always a little devilish. And so, uh, so I'm one of those 13 people in that very famous photo just because I happen to be at the MIT AI lab at the right time at the right place. Right. And in fact, uh, uh, Emacs, I, I'm one of the contributors to this uh, program called Emacs, which is a really fabulous editor that, I don't know, do they use it anymore? Oh, yeah. uh, but you could type uh, control alt option X, and it would cause the elevator to open. Or you control delete uh, alpha something, and uh, a person who was really good at Emacs could just whip right through a task by using these really arcane symbols. And uh, it was really a lot of fun. I helped write macros for Emacs which allowed uh, RMS to work on the new project. We had uh, Richard Stallman here at the Geek Fest last night, and uh, he did a couple of songs. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> the email song. Yeah, the email song and then the, the song about APL. It was funny. We had a concert here. 
The Stallman yeah, pencil. RMS, RMS is, is a naturally shy person. But because of this position he's taken upon himself to push uh, open, or I should say, uh, free software, that he's gone outside of his comfort zone, and uh, he gives talks about this. And he's become very good at it. Even though he's very shy, he's able to do these things like sing a little song uh, probably better than I could do it. So, uh, so I'm very proud of him. Yeah. Uh, I, I read somewhere that you worked on, let me quit visual RE research. I didn't know what that is. Can you explain uh, that? Well, during my first uh, time at Stanford, uh, I worked, uh, actually, it's funny, uh, every job I got, I, I really didn't really know what I was doing when I started the job. But I had friends and I had uh, mentors and uh, I learned what I needed to learn to do each job. And um, But by the end, uh, I knew it all. And so I always tried for another job at the next level up. And so I went from one level to the next level to the next level. And uh, and I ended up doing some really neat programming things be that I had no idea what I was uh, doing when I first started. Uh, one of these things was at uh, the, um, it's called SRI International. It used to be called Stanford Research Institute, um, but it, it uh, became SRI International. And I worked at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory there doing visual research. Um, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, it was brand new. Uh, but everything that we, we came up with was uh, was valuable and useful in its own way. And so uh, I, I actually uh, helped with some of the original vision research at the AI lab at SRI International. Uh, though it was a government, it was a government institution, so they were very careful about uh, the proprietary nature of their software, and so they didn't want us to be hackers. I'm afraid I'm getting in the sun now. I might have to move my, uh, my thing here. Oh, sorry about that. Is there a bigger shadow area somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, I might have to move here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. So it's not totally uh, ruined. <laughs> oh, that's that's ruined. <laughs> I want to hear from the next speaker. I'm very interested to hear what he has to say about this uh, vulnerability. Yeah, but we have some time. We have some time. Um, you have a degree in symbolic systems and self-designed concentration in brain style computation? Yes. Uh, what's that? Okay, so uh, so the, the first time I went to Stanford, I, I dropped out. Uh, I, went, I went traveling. I, I didn't, they didn't have a computer science major at Stanford for undergraduates. And uh, so uh, even though I was an artificial intelligence programmer and I had all this wonderful research under my belt, They didn't have a degree for me at Stanford, so I went hitchhiking. I went traveling. Uh, that's how I ended up at MIT in the early 80s. That uh, uh, One day I walked into the MIT AI lab and said, uh, hey, guys, what are you doing here? And by the end of the day, uh, I had a job working there as a programmer. Uh, and then much later, in, in the late, late 80s, uh, 1989, I went back to Stanford to finish um, uh, to get a college degree. Uh, I had gone for many years without a, a college degree, but working perfectly nicely in industry. But, you know, getting a degree from Stanford seemed to be a good idea. And so in 89, I, I returned to Stanford, and, uh, and uh, they didn't have a computer science major yet, still, for undergraduates, but they had something called symbolic systems. Uh, symbolic systems was an interdisciplinary major that in involves uh, artificial intelligence, linguistics, uh, philosophy, and cognitive science. Those were my interests. And, and uh, so, so I became a uh, symbolic systems major. And my specific interest was uh, uh, massively parallel systems. Uh, we call them PDP, Parallel Distributed Programming. Uh, you might know it as uh, neural networks. And uh, this was brand new then. Uh, this was in 1989, and uh, uh, David Rummelhart uh, was the, the father of the uh, neural network systems. And I went to him, and I said, Hey, uh, I need an advisor, and uh, I'm really interested in this parallel distributed processing. So I'd sure. And so, uh, so the first time I was at Stanford, uh, Ed Feigenbaum, the, the father of AI, was my mentor. And then when I went back to Stanford, uh, uh, Romo Hart was my teacher. And uh, it's it's amazing what you can do when your your teachers are you know the, the world the world class instigators of the whole thing. And um, and so I finally uh, graduated from Stanford in '91 with a degree in uh, symbolic systems, and my specialty was neural networks, 
And what I was very interested in was uh, the ethics of using artificial intelligence. I thought, gee, someday we're going to actually have real AI systems, and maybe we should uh, give them an ethical background from the very start so they don't do things like you know, wipe out the human race, you know, whatever. And uh, so, so for years and years, we've worked on the problem of, of ethics and how that would work in artificial intelligence. And I finally came up with a solution. It's all about uh, the planet, uh, ecological survival. You know, uh, uh, ethical systems in the human world are, you know, based on this religion or that religion or this belief system. But when you base your ethics on sustainability and ecosystem survival, it's way more than some human characteristic or some human ideas. It's ecosystem survival. And so, uh, so what we tried to do is make an ethical artificial intelligence that was uh, based on sustainability rather than uh, any human ethical uh, manners. And, uh, and uh, they're still working on it today. <laughs> yeah. What do you uh, think of the self-driving cars? Uh, do, do they ever will come to the main streets or will they have special streets where only they are driving? Yeah, it's really amazing to see artificial intelligence working in the world today uh, with these self-driving cars. It uses the neural networks as part of their uh, guidance systems. And, uh, it's a little scary to, for me to think that you uh, get into a little car and let somebody else drive. But, uh, you know, I live here in Silicon Valley. And sometimes you'll be driving down the freeway and you look over and there's a people in a car with nobody in the driver's seat. <laughs> I can remember, yeah, last year when I was in Amsterdam, they've got these electric cars. They're all over Amsterdam, and they can park anywhere legally. And uh, if you if you can buy into these little cars, and uh, you you pick a car that's not being used, and you put your iPhone up to the windshield of the car, and it recognizes you. It opens up the car for you, assuming, of course, you're registered for the service, and they charge you 50 euro cents a minute to use the car. And then when you're done, if you're t if you're less than 10 percent charged, they give you 15 minutes of credit to get to a charger to charge the car. And uh, and then, of course, I just heard this story uh, recently, a couple of months ago, where uh, one of the Tesla model cars had a had a wreck because it was not recognizing a truck. And it, it ran right into a truck because it, it was looked like it was a background and it couldn't it couldn't discern exactly what was there. But I would it be was probably human error. Yeah, I, I really would be interested in your view of if we ever see self-driving cars on main streets. Oh, yeah. I, I have no question that you're going to see that. Yeah. Okay. And, and many more things that we don't even know or think about today are going to become commonplace uh, because of artificial intelligence. It's it's coming. It really is coming. Like the drones, you know, in the USA, they, they just legalized commercial use of drones as long as they uh, they uh, follow and don't go into prohibited spaces like over Air Force bases or the White House. And they stay <laughs> within about 400 uh, feet uh, below uh, the altitude. And so they're just now becoming uh, used and... Uh, um, people like uh, like these um, uh, order houses you can order now and you can have products delivered now, pizza delivered by a drone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only thing I liked was, was uh, uh, first aid with drones. That's a very good idea, I think, with a, with a, that you can bring medicine or, or something to someone in, uh, that needs help very fast. So when you can program that system, that will be... A very good thing, I believe. It would help many people. Yeah. yeah Again, yeah. I want to remind people to uh, to uh, Twitter and tweet uh, at uh, scrat at hashtag Geekfest Berlin. If you have any questions, please uh, go there. And Oliver, you can mention the other way that they can come and ask questions. Yeah, they can use our page, uh, 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 the speakers page, or the the schedule page. Sorry, the schedule page. And there are links to go and ask questions to our speakers. Roy. Okay, can I, uh, can I change the subject a little bit? Yes, you can. Okay, so I was uh, living in Silicon Valley uh, with a degree in computer science uh, and a lot of experience as a programmer. But we, something new came up uh, at the turn of the century, uh, 1998. I stopped being a, uh, a programmer. And I became a uh, new economy 
consultant that uh, until that day, I'd always had a job working for an employer. But in 1998, I became self-employed. I started to take my services, my knowledge and experience, and shop it out to see if I could make part-time work uh, as self-employed. And in fact, it was very effective. And I was one of the first uh, computer consultants, IT consultants in 98. And uh, uh, we had something called guru.com. I don't know if that still exists, but the whole idea is that uh, it was a new way of, of working where you would, everybody I would be actually, self-employed. I actually used that myself to find work, and it worked quite well, actually. Uh-huh. I got myself some contracting work with some Stanford students for a, uh, an e-commerce website using yeah, yeah. guru.com. Well, um, it, it turns out it was very powerful, uh, the idea of uh, having a workforce that's all self-employed and, uh, and very, it's uh, agile. It's an overused word now. But uh, in 1998, it was a very agile thing to be able to hire just who you needed, just for what you needed. And uh, we, this was in Silicon Valley, and there were a lot of startup companies. And so I worked for, uh, I don't know, probably eight or nine different startup companies in the space of three years. And uh, I was getting paid a lot of money. Uh, doing really very interesting work, uh, uh, very Im- important. These, some of these companies have become big companies now. Um, and uh, uh, it was just the new way of, of working. We call it the new economy. And uh, part of the new economy was the idea is that uh, uh, you would use your, your efforts to create uh, a new company, and then you would sell the company or go public and make just rain money, just rain money. <laughs> this is the new economy. Uh, in fact, it never quite uh, turned out what we were hoping for. But in fact, uh, I've been self-employed since '98, and I still have a lot of clients who still call me. And uh, I still think that uh, there's a for the future, uh, the gig economy, which is starting up, and the the whole sharing economy. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to become self-employed in the future, and uh, the regular traditional employment is going to be a thing of the past. Yeah, let's hope that big corporations will be in the past. <laughs> and you are you are you are not longer working for money, right? Yeah, so I I had several careers. I was a computer guy for many many years, a programmer, and then I was a, uh, a independent consultant uh, working for startup companies, and then I got into sustainability. And my third career was in sustainability. I became a general contractor, the first green general contractor in my area. And now I'm sort of on my fourth career, where it's not really a career. It's a non-traditional. I don't work for money really much anymore. Um, I still have clients and I still work, but I don't get paid money. I get services and places to, uh, it's hard to explain. It's, it's a whole new way of, of uh, hacking the money world is what I do. Uh, so in the past uh, three years, I've been essentially uh, uh, not making money. But my lifestyle has been just as good, if not better. Great. Have you a question? Um, I think so. I don't have a question. You don't. But um, let me think. Um, Tell me uh, a little bit more about the... uh, those solar panels that you were getting giving away for free. Uh, I can remember that in Palo Alto with, when you were at Daniel Kaki's place. Now, Daniel Kaki, of course, was, I think, in one of our Geek Fests last year. He yes. is a former Apple employee, good friend of Steve Wozniak and Jobs. And uh, and uh, we you came over with some solar panels, I think. And he was also using them up, up in, in some property he was thinking of uh, getting. Yeah, I was wondering what, what happened to that. Okay, well, there's a sort of a background story to it. That uh, in in uh, in my basically, I had a two year experiment of living outside of the regular money economy. I wanted to go for two years without money, and I did. Uh, I'm on my third year now, but uh, it it turns out that uh, part of in order to live without the regular money world, there's many things that I have to do: uh, uh, gifting and sharing, time banks, uh, dumpster diving. Uh, I work for eco villages. Uh, there's many different things. But one of the most powerful one is called the gift culture. And uh, uh, I actually worked on the gift culture for many different times at MIT. 
we had uh, we had several of these things where uh, how do I say it? It was like it'd be like a, a gift party where you bring to the party a uh, swag. Uh, stuff that you got for free, uh, things that, that were given to you as part of your normal life, but it's extra stuff. So you bring your extra swag to the party to give away, and other people bring their swag to the party. And it becomes a big giveaway where everybody goes home with different stuff than they came with, but you go home with your friend's uh, old toys and old swag. And, and uh, it, was, it was a really popular thing, having the, the gift exchanges. And uh, uh, I've done it over the years, and uh, in my new life now, living outside of the regular money economy, gifting is very powerful. That uh, I, uh, because of the way I do things, the way I've been doing it for so long, I receive a lot of gifts. Um, and because I receive so many gifts, that what do I do with them all? So what I do is I give my gifts to my friends, and I have this uh, this big community of uh, gifting where uh, where. Everything that I get that's extra that I don't need disappears into the gifting world. But things magically appear from my, I'm always, it's just, it's just insane. I can't tell you that uh, the gifting is very, very powerful. How about this? I've, uh, I've owned seven vehicles in my life. Uh, and every single one of those seven, I've given away, well, except for the last number seven I still have, I've given away all of my vehicles. The, but the fact that I give away my vehicles when I'm done with them as gifts instead of selling them, because I do this, my last three my last three vehicles I got for free as gifts, and so it's kind of funny that uh, uh, I have I drive a free car, a car that I got as a gift, and I guarantee that when I get my next my number eight, when I get my next free car, number seven, I'm going to give it away to somebody, and um, uh, it's a very powerful thing uh, this gifting culture and. Uh, uh, I forgot what the question was, Captain Crunch. <laughs> yeah, I can remember a couple of years ago we were driving around in your Solar BMW. Panels. Was that a BMW? Uh, is that what it was? Oh, uh, I used to drive a new Mercedes. Uh, That's right. Oh, it was a Mercedes, and you got it for free. Uh, my my wife at the time uh, had a rich uncle, or has a rich uncle, and uh, he would lease uh, a brand new Mercedes for her every two years. So so she always was brought, driving a brand new Mercedes, and because I was married to her. I got to use the car, and so uh, uh, I, I didn't even need it because I had a free car of my own. And also, my daughter, my daughter had a free car, so all of us drove uh, gift cars for years. But the solar panels—that's an interesting story. That uh, I had a friend named Bob Proctor, and uh, he was a really rich guy, but he was really tight with his money, <laughs> and uh, uh, he owned a lot of rental properties, and he was a general contractor. And so, so for years, I did uh, work for Bob Proctor. But I never got paid in money. Um, uh, because he had been a, a contractor for many years, he had saved every single bit of all the little parts from all of his projects and set them up in his back. He had what's called a corporation yard in his backyard. And by the time I knew Roy, uh, I, mean, I knew uh, Bob, uh, it was about an acre. And it was all very carefully organized and stacked. And it was just imagine a very large hardware store that has just about anything you need, but it's all extras and old stuff or used stuff. And and because I was a uh, a green contractor at the time, I tried to use only materials that were I had recovered from some other job or something that I'd come. And so so anyways, so for years uh, as a green contractor, I would visit Bob Proctor's corporation yard and get raw materials. And so we had this wonderful thing where I would work for him, but not get paid money. But whenever I needed raw materials, I could just go to his corporation yard and take whatever I wanted. And uh, uh, and this is a I've done this many sort of thing this sort of thing many different times in my life where I work for people but I don't get money. Uh, my ex-wife for years and years I've been working for my ex-wife and taking care of her properties. She's never paid me once. But I have this big uh, uh, debt. It's it's it's, it's kind of mental. But anyway, the point is. That Bob Proctor, this wonderful guy that I worked for for years, he ended up passing away, and, uh, and that's a little sad because I had this. I developed over many many years. I developed this system with him, um, and so his last gift, just before he passed away, he gave me uh, 26 uh, photovoltaic uh, panels that he had been uh, saving for a project he was going to put put up. And you know, these PV panels are probably nine hundred dollars a piece. And so I got 26 of them free as a gift from Bob Proctor as he was dying. And, but what was I going to do with 26 solar panels? 
And so what I did was I took uh, the solar panels to my gifting circles and I gave them all away. And one of them, I think two of them, I think two of them I gave to Dan Kotke uh, and he used to use them on, uh, on his project. Yeah, I can remember that. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't solar photovoltaic. They were thermal. They were yeah. thermal solar panel. Yeah. Yeah, they weren't solar panel. They were, they were thermal. Uh, solar water heaters, actually. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. We have here one question uh, and on our uh, ask a question, uh, ask a speaker function. And it, is, it goes to you and it is, says, uh, how close do you think we are to real AI? It's coming from, <laughs> it's coming from the bug, <laughs> the question. Okay, um, uh, I can answer that easily. We have it today. We have uh, uh, this uh, in technology in uh, in uh, using uh, lab laboratory systems. Uh, we have uh, computers who play chess. Uh, we have robots uh, who autonomously do work. Uh, AI is already alive in uh, uh, the self-driving cars. But what you may be talking about is uh, machines that are self-aware. Uh, uh, really uh, alive sort of living computer systems. And uh, I think we're only going to get that once we change our system. Right now we have digital computers that run programs. And as long as we use that paradigm, uh, artificial intelligence is just going to be a program running on a computer. Uh, there's actually efforts, uh, look it up on the internet, there's something called Numenta, N-U-M-E-N-T-A. And Numenta uh, is a, uh, a, in, here in Menlo Park where uh, they're using uh, ar uh, artificial intelligence methods uh, uh, based on connectionism, on the parallel programming, on the neural networks. And uh, it's, it's, you're actually able to build in systems now that use neural networks for doing artificial intelligence that aren't programming. Uh, there's no code. It's just the system relaxes each time and gets smarter and smarter. And, uh, they have a system now that, that works on the, uh, the Amazon web system, AWS, where it will, it will simply sit and look at your system, and, and it, over time it analyzes, 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 and it makes a really good simulation of your system. But if there's something wrong with your system, if you've got some, uh, some programming problem, it will identify it. And uh, so Numenta is, is a, a new programming paradigm that uh, is uh, brain-styled programming rather than uh, what we have computer-style programming. And my degree from Stanford was in brain-style programming. So I've been uh, uh, very interested in Numenta and what they've been doing, and, uh, and I'm very glad that they're making progress. Do we have questions here in the room for our speaker? No questions. Actually. And what about from Twitter? Any questions from Twitter? <laughs> no questions Nothing from Twitter. Twitter. All right. But I want to tell, uh, if there's any young people out there today, uh, young people, it's, it's so hard to get started in, in the world. And, uh, and where do you start? What do you do? And, and, and I can tell you, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you just pick something that you're very passionate about, uh, learn everything you can about it, and get yourself a mentor. Um, when I was a young hacker, I knew nothing. But I had a mentor. And my mentor had come from the MIT AI lab and to Stanford, and uh, he taught me what I knew, needed to know to be a hacker. Uh, and it, it's really hard to be a hacker just by looking at the Internet. You really, the way that I know is to have a mentor. We and, have a uh, young nine-year-old coming on here later at the Geek Fest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's ten now. Come on. Okay. <laughs> he's ten, ten now. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and again, uh, not only is it good to have a mentor to help you launch your career, but once you have a career, once you uh, have uh, connections and you belong to the community, it's good to take young people and mentor them. And uh, I've been doing that for, for many years, and it's very powerful. I have a, a community. I, like I have a, a sharing community where we share our extra stuff. Uh, I have a mentor community where uh, I, I consider Captain Crunch one of my mentors, for instance. That, uh, that if you have a problem or some situation you don't know, you can take it to your mentor and they might have more experience than you. Or you can take it to the, the people that you mentor and they might have an, uh, an experience or outlook because they're younger and they know more things. And so, so being in the middle uh, where you have uh, mentors helping you and you help others, that's really the, the right paradigm for, for success in the world today. 
uh, it's really hard for one person to uh, to get a, a grip. Another thing is that uh, in this world, it's very much um, uh, specialized and uh, specialized in a subspecialty. And and a lot of people get trapped into thinking that there's just one thing that they can do. And they get, that's not quite true. Uh, most people are uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. And uh, in my career, I always try to uh, have my income stream from many different directions. And so I was I was being as a consultant and a contractor, and uh, I taught classes. Um, it was very very powerful for me that uh, uh, you, you know losing a, for many people you lose your job and you're completely hosed. But if you're self-employed and your and your income comes from many different directions, it's very resilient. And uh, and I want to tell young people that uh, you know getting a job, having a regular career, is not the only way. <laughs> yeah. That's good to good that you say that. Yeah, thank you for that, and thank you for being part here. And uh, I think there is time for an applause. And thank you. <laughs> so uh, we have a special guest here tonight, and uh, if you want, we have a good. Uh, uh, we have no feedback, so if you want, you can stay online here. And uh, I will uh, change the stage here because we have a special guest. We uh, two days ago we didn't knew that we will have him, but today we have him. That's very nice. Old meets new. Old meets new, right? This is Carsten Noel, and I think you will introduce him a little bit. Yeah, Carlston is the uh, one who uh, discovered the security flaws in the. Uh, Secure it in the uh, signaling system seven of the phone company, which ties together every single telephone in the whole wide world, including, of course, cell phones, land phones, and just about every other phone. So we'll give him a few moments here and take a break and give him time to set up his uh, presentation material. In the meantime, I have some.